Thank you. So, uh, okay, welcome everyone. So, although the uh, Zoom is telling you that uh, it's Nikolai Shilov speaking, uh, it's not Nikolai Shilov. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, in front of the camera so we can see you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Nikolai is uh, uh, in the Defense Committee now, so I'm replacing him. And uh, I'm welcoming Professor uh, Joseph Brown, who is the head of the Artificial Intelligence and Games Development Lab at Tenopolis University with the affordance theory in game design talk with the, um, uh, how, to, how, how to say this, <laughs> uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So the idea of today, uh, I'm gonna kind of split it into two different uh, segments in terms of the uh, presentation. Uh, so the first half is going to be uh, about kind of some of this research that we've done in terms of uh, completed research in the book. And then what I was asked to do is, since this is the software engineering uh, talk series, is to come up with something a little bit more speculative. It may be something that could be used beyond just what's inside of games design, but that could also be used in a variety of different fields. So this research is coming out of about you now five years of work from myself and uh, Hema Zlom. And it's kind of the generation and the, the synthesis of all of this work that's inside of the book that's available. Um, so we, of course, decided that the best time to publish a brand new textbook would be during the middle of a global pandemic, because you know that's great. And we made it about you know, human playtesting. So, you know, that's the perfect thing to talk about when you can't have any humans in a room is how to play test with humans in the room. So uh, it is available. It's available in both print and ebook uh, forms from the, the link there. And I'll give it another plug later on. But the idea of this is how do we kind of take the current thinking of affordance theory in, that's used in a lot of different design uh, locations and how do we then move that into the field of games design? especially from the ideas of understanding players and playtesting. So the objectives again today, we're gonna to give an understanding of Norman and Gibson's definition of affordances, uh, give a bit of an understanding of this Aslam Brown synthesis that takes into account both Norman and Gibson. And then we're gonna take a look at some applications of both of these inside of game rules and dice creation and fairness. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the focus conversational model, also known as the ORID or ORID model, and how it can be related to a few different uh, systems. In fact, one of the co-authors on that is our entry presenter here. So I'm going to start. Uh, this is a little bit of an interactive talk. We'll try to be a bit interactive with those that are on the, the Zoom as well. I would like for you to describe for me a teapot. And yes, this is a trick question, but the trick is it's something that can uh, help you brew a tea. Okay, it can help you brew a tea. Okay. What does a teapot have? Candle. Candle. Okay. Anyone on the Zoom? A spout. Oh, oh my goodness, yes. Right. Like the old song, I'm a little teapot shirt and stout. Here's my handle, here's my coat. Oh, two pieces. From the song. What else does a teapot have? What's it made of? Heat hmm? elements. It might have a heat element inside of it. Porcelain. Porcelain. Okay, it's got to somehow, maybe it holds the tea. It has a lid. Any other things? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to. Like the strainer that you put the tea in? I think that that filter is out. Yes. Yeah. So the strainer inside of the tea you might have a strainer inside of it. Okay. Anything else? It's a teapot. How would you describe it to a child? A container for liquids. Container for liquids. Okay. So optionally, that it's easy to pour from. Optionally, that's easy to pour from. Down the, down the road, Marco. 
security you've maybe seen with this description. So we may say a large area to hold tea. We may say it has a lid on top. We may say it has a handle on the lid to open up the lid. Okay. Handle to allow for pouring. Has a spout somewhere for the liquid to come out of. Okay. Made of a non-porous heat resistant material because it's got a bowl of water that's hot. So this is a this is actually a coffee pot in this, but this is coming out of uh, this is coming out of a book on um, impossible objects, the catalog of objects uh, basically impossible to build or that are, are dangerous. And this is known as the uh, cat the cafeteria for masochisti. So it's basically a teapot for masochists. And so the idea here is you go to pour your tea and it spills it all over your arm. Okay. And I think that this is the thing that we do as designers when we ask people, you know, tell us what a thing is, is sometimes we hear what they want and we end up building them masochistic objects. Objects that, but you told me everything and I did everything you wanted. And then the user says, but that's not what I wanted. And anyone that's worked in industry for any length of time with users asking them, how do you want this program to work? How do you want this thing to work? has probably come upon this problem where you felt as if you built something that it was beautiful and great and gracious and that you spent all of your time, energy and efforts. And then as soon as it was built, the object was basically completely unusable for them. Now, what went wrong is pretty much the process of anyone talking to a user as a developer. So this met with the specification. Everything that was there, the spout, the handle, all of these things were completely factually correct. All these things led into that model. But conceptually, what the object was used for, I completely missed the point. I didn't have an idea of what this object was really being designed for. One of the other objects that does this, which is absolutely beautiful, and now there's an upcoming book about this, is uh, Chinese warlord pistols. From kind of the warlord era where they had shipped over all of these you know handguns in the kind of the warring uh period between world war one and world war ii and they were creating basically in machine shops out the backyard they were making pistols and they had examples of like what westernized mausers and various other you know room handle mausers and stuff like that and then what they did was they said to this guy who had never seen a pistol before in his life he was a farmer a blacksmith they said make me one of and so what you see is all of these kind of, you know, mystery guns where they basically put them together just to kind of look like that other thing as to whether it fires, maybe not, as to whether it works, maybe not. And then even things like the sights, they'll just be like drilled out in various ways and they'll put markings on it that kind of look like company logos and proof marks, but they have no meaning whatsoever. And it's the idea of you have an object of design and you're building the thing how it looks, but you're not necessarily building it to the same functionality because you don't even understand what the functionality is. So in this case, you gave me all of these parts that are made up a teapot, but I didn't understand it. You didn't want to burn yourself, what the usability is. Okay. And part of this is going back in, even into the lean concepts. There's this idea inside of there of go and get your boots on go down and see the problem, go down and see the machine and understand it. This is where inside of games development, playtesting comes into uh, use because we cannot see the video game in the same way as the player and what they will do with it. If you really wanna muck stuff up, hand somebody else your code, they will find errors. And so the playtesting process is about understanding, diagnosing, and figuring out why are these errors even happening inside of it. Okay. And part of this is also the idea of acting like an alien, acting like a creature outside of your norms, which is very hard for a lot of people to put aside that developer's bias and then act in a way where you're looking at this from the first time. I love this comment, Strange Planet by Nathan Pyle. In fact, they're going to be getting, I think, a um, television series by the creators of Rick and Morty. One of the creators, Dan Harmon, is taking this project on where they're going to turn this into a strip. 
And the idea is there's these little blue aliens and they're kind of just looking at all of these objects anew, brand new. So common objects to them become quite astonishing. And there's some different ways that they see this of, you know, sunburns become star damage, right? I crave the star damage. Or coffee is jitter liquid. Would you like some more jitter liquid? So if we go into this little uh, cartoon here, he says, what's the purpose of this board game? He says, for the group, entertainment. And the other little alien goes, friends. But individually, domination, inferiors. Are you confident you understand? For me, ignorance is confidence that you will lose validly, but it will be bittersweet. So when we look at these objects, we have to diagnose it from the standpoint of not really understanding the objects, coming to it with the beginner's mind. That's very hard for developers. And there's all sorts of different technologies and techniques that have been put in this place. There's personas, there's all sorts of literature about this idea. But nothing beats the fact of taking someone that has never seen the object, handing them the object, and seeing what happens. And so again, it goes back to play testing and using new players is a great way to start to see these sorts of issues. James Jerome Gibson, uh, he was a, a psychologist, and he was looking at this from the standpoint of what he was calling affordances. What is the affordance of the object? What does the object afford you to do? So to him, anything that the object could possibly ever be used for is an affordance of the object. So if you could see this object as doing this role, then that is an affordance of the object. So this could be along the lines of if we take a pen, a pen is a pen, okay? But if I looked at it as an alien, what could it be? It's a human chew toy, right? Some people chew on their pens, it's a human chew toy. It could stir coffee. It could press a button that's far away. It can act as a pointer. Maybe it's used inside of some sort of like tracheotomy. I can break it in half and use the pieces for something else. Okay. To Gibson, all of that was what the pen as an object affords. And he was focusing primarily on the visual ability to perceive this object and its actions. One of his students was Donald Norman. And to those inside of the UX domain, we've probably heard about this name again and again and again. So I was beaten to death with it inside of my own undergraduate, this book here, The Psychology of Everyday Things, or later retitled to The Design of Everyday Things. So many everyday things, which should make sense, do not, because they're designed for form and not function. Norman, there's this whole classification of what he calls, uh, what, well, he didn't call them this, but later on they were known as Norman doors. And this is anytime you come up to a door and don't know whether to push or pull, it's a Norman door. Okay. And you see how people get around that. They put signs, push, pull, right, on front of their doors. But the design principle that Norman is looking for is how do we make it so it's impossible that someone will push a pull door or pull a push door? So if I come to a bar, that affords the action of pushing. So therefore, the action that, of that door is to push it. If it has a handle, that affords the action of pulling. And I think if we go around and look at pretty much any building and the doors within it, we will find doors that do not follow these types of principles inside of them that are hard to use. So to Norman, the affordance is not all possible things that the object is able to do. It's what is most likely for the object to do. It's what can be perceived and acted upon inside of the conceptual model. So a push bar affords pushing. Now you could pull, according to Gibson, you could pull a push door. You could pull on that bar. So that still is an affordance to Gibson, but to Norman, the affordance is pushing because it, what it signifies that inside of the conceptual model. And so Norman laid out these ideas that things should be visible. The action of the object should be visible from the object in and of itself. 
if this is if this clicker has a button to advance the slide, there has to be a symbol on it that looks like advance the slide. And in fact, if there's one to decrement the slide and increase the slide, then it should probably also be different in terms of as many senses as possible. The color, the touch, the feeling on it should give me a sense of where I have my hand, even when I'm not looking at it, to afford an ability inside of this. So he's looking at very, very detailed principles of when is an object good from a design perspective. He also deals with the idea of a conceptual model so that we're constantly having this feedback loop and this understanding and re-understanding of what's happening. The idea of mappings. Are there certain buttons that easily map to actions? So the push button should always be the push button that should advance the slide. It shouldn't bounce around on the keyboard and change. And in order to allow for the conceptual model, there has to be some form of feedback loop. There has to be something that I can look at and go, oh, I made a mistake. How do I correct that? I understand it to be this now. And like many, many, many philosophical arguments, I would say that Gibson and Norman boil back to the ideas of Plato and Aristotle. And there's lots of arguments that inside of uh, philosophy, especially that pretty much all of Western philosophy up into the modern day is a re-argument of what Plato and Aristotle said, specifically from the idea of Plato being the idealist, that there's this essence, there's this perfect form, whereas Aristotle was more looking at empirical analysis. So if we were to say like Plato, we go into a supermarket, okay? We're gonna arrange all the shelves in a supermarket. What Plato would do is he would put all of the names for the different items up on the boards first, and then say, put the item into the place in the supermarket. What Aristotle would do is he would dump all of the stuff that you're gonna sell into the supermarket into a pile, classify it, and then make rows out of that. So it's kind of top down versus bottom up inside of this. And we can see now why these arguments keep being repeated and repeated and repeated. So Gibson is kind of going from the perspective of this, you know, everything is an affordance. And then you have to figure out what happens with it. Whereas Norman is going with, no, there's a perfect way to do it. So it's almost an inverted Plato-Aristotle argument. Okay. Hegelian dialectic from this, right? If we have a a thesis and we have an antithesis, then maybe there's a synthesis. And so what Hamna uh, and I have been working on is how do we synthesize this? How do we use both the elements of Norman and the elements of Gibson inside of this? So if you remember that Gibson sets that outer universe of, universe of what the object affords, Norman sets what is the best thing according to the rational user. Well, there's signifiers, there's choices of design. There's actions that we can make in order to have a perception of this interior set. So anything outside of the Norman set might be deemed to be an error or a different use case for the object. So this kind of conjoins these two atmospheres of objects into something more concrete that we can then deal with. There is lots of research that says Gibson is the only way. There's lots of research that says Norman is the only way we look at an object like this. Our argument is, no, there's a middle ground. We can use both of these principles inside of this kind of universal set of Gibson and this kind of accepted good state of Norman. And the question becomes, how do we get from these exterior states of the Norman set and push them towards the Norman set? And in fact, this is really what Norman is even trying to do, but doesn't really codify it in this way. He's more busy fighting with Gibson than to spend the time to say what, what it means to get there. And I think that this gets a lot closer into what design is. Uh, there's this kind of misconception that design is this kind of monolithic thing. Someone sits down in front of a you know drafting screen, they design something completely there, they send it to the patent office, it's patented. And then forever that is the design. But that is not really what happens. There's no, not really this sort of uh, build this brand new thing from scratch. It's from the perspective of evolution over time, small changes in design, small improvements in design. And each one of those small improvements then becomes 
a patent. Usually there is inside of a patent something that says, here's what the previous work is, and you're talking about my improvement upon the process is. So there's something that was already there usually. Okay. We can see these sorts of iterations in design. Uh, another good book for this, The Evolution of Useful Things. And we can see this even inside of history where there is this kind of movement between uh, people eating with two knives. Well, if I'm eating with two knives, there's maybe some issues with that, right? One becomes a little bit more flatter, right? Because maybe I want to start to scoop things. So then we started kind of eating with a knife and a prong, something to hold it while we can then cut and then eat with the prong. But a prong allows the food to then spiral around and go in circles, right? So we need two, two prongs on the end, right? So we start to see this two times, right? And if you see modern day carving forks, that pretty much is what people were eating with for a while. And then over time, it moved into the modern day fork. And then even there, the different sizes, what we get at Ikea today, it's constantly evolving and changing dependent upon what we're doing. And then after this, you somewhere have this fork because we need to have a spoon and a fork together. Maybe that's the next piece of the evolution of coupling. But there are these types of small improvements over time, depending upon the use case, as we get better in various technologies and techniques. So to pause again, probably everybody's played Monopoly at some point or another. Okay, are we familiar with this space? Okay, so my question is, here we see free parking. Can anybody tell me what the rule is when you land on free parking? Don't pay for staying here. Don't pay for staying here? Anyone do anything different when you land on free parking? No? Okay, so you have probably read the rule book then. Okay. <laughs> I know a lot of people play free parking with house rules. Like you take all of the taxes that are generated by landing on different squares and you put them in the middle of the board. And if you land on free parking, then you get the money back. Right? That can sometimes happen. Okay. So what happens? Well, the answer in the rules is nothing happens. Okay. So us being great rules readers, we probably did that. But 68% of respondents in a survey to Hasbro said that they had never actually read the game's rules in Monopoly. 68% have never read the rules of Monopoly. 30% said that they made up rules while they played the game. And some of those house rules have now been somewhat officialized. There's been a version of this uh, put out inside of games where you can do this. Now, here's the biggest issue with this from a games design perspective, and as someone who reads a lot about games design, Monopoly is probably one of the most maligned games to game designers. It's the one that everybody likes to point out as being a terribly designed game. And in fact, the original purpose of Monopoly as a game was not to be a fun game to play. It was meant to be an object to show why capitalism would fail. It was to show that it's terrible because you know, you're know you putting rents on people and it would cause a crash and one person's gonna end up with all of the money. That was supposed to be like an educational lesson. And instead it turned into a fun thing that we play with children. But through that, so many rules are designed inside of this game to speed up play. The number one complaint about Monopoly is it takes too much bloody time to play a game of Monopoly. They last days, they last weekends. They last months. And mostly that has to do with people are not following the rules of monopoly and making stuff up. So money keeps being introduced into the system. It's like quantitative easing game rather than monopoly game. So things like bidding on properties, if you land on a property that you get to bid for it if somebody doesn't buy it, which puts the cards into play quicker, taking properties from those who are bankrupted. If you bankrupt a number player, you're supposed to take everything they own which we can see why that would then speed up play because you have more access to the boards, more cards are held in play. A lot of players will do that as, okay, you're bankrupted, everything goes into the pile and you have to rebuy it. 
So these entire three, four, five day games of monopoly shouldn't exist according to the games rules. And then that's the thing that games designers then yell at. But I'm more worried about the fact that 68% of the respondents have never read the rules to Monopoly and 30% are making them up as they go along. That's why Monopoly sucks as a game. So we keep making rules for it and don't play them well. Okay. From an anecdotal study by Rob Davino, uh, another very big uh, well-known game designer, uh, he said that the rule books should be minimized and rules should be embedded into the game. I absolutely agree with this statement that the rule book should be as small as possible, that we should just be able to play the game looking at the objects that are inside. Of it. And he went to MIT and he says, these are guys that are making space lasers and nuclear microwaves and stuff like this, and that they should be able to figure out from just looking at the game objects, remove the rule books, just by looking at the game objects, they should be able to figure out the rules. And he did this process and put all of these rules in front of the people that were playing the game. And they said, wow, they made it, they had an amazing job. They came up with these rules very well. Okay, I got a problem with that as a scientist. What does amazing mean? How is that quantified? What is an amazing job of finding out rules? How many rules were found out? Which rules were found out? Which rules were not found out? What is the issues? So through this anecdote, we decided, can we somehow put a test around? Can we make this process more scientific? So I'm gonna try science and see, can we look at this from a scientific perspective? So we did the exact same study. This was at a uh, board game, or sorry, a games development uh, seminar here at Annapolis over the winter. You can see because I, I'm not, you know, it's also me much younger because I still have a bit more hair. Um, what, what year, what year uh, it is? And, <laughs> I can see people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you might know a few people. So this is about three, four years ago that we did this original mm. study, the pilot study. And we went through an observational process. Again, me with more hair. Uh, and so we had various uh, observers looking at the teams, how they worked with the objects, what they did with the objects. And then we asked them at the end in order to give presentations to describe the game. But, so we gave them a series of games and quantified what those games are. And we also had criteria for the rules assessment. We had them actually fill out a form in regards to this. So the following aspects were considered, the identification of the number of players, the identification of the overall rules of the game and identification of the winning study. And so through this, we can see that there were some games that were easier to find the pieces than others easier to figure out how many players there should be, easier to pick out a winning strategy. So like uh, Carcassonne there, the number of players, well, there's different colors for each player. So they remark that the color of the player determines the number of players. So if there's 15 different you know, colors, therefore there's 15 different players or eight different players. Through all of this, we can see that certain ones, no idea of this. And in fact, we there was one piece that in this initial study, we should have done, but didn't. We didn't remove the box. And in fact, some of these games like Flip City actually had for this many to this many players. They didn't read the box that had the information that they were required to give. Others did. Some had issues with prediction of the rules. So Love Letter is a game that has all of the rules right on the card. The card itself tells you how that card is played and act. So that's very simple for them. Conversely, there was some that are harder than others. And in fact, Kano Thierry was very difficult for players to come up with reasons to, that it works. Winning strategy, Pirate Flux has cards that are called gold, which literally say on them, if you complete this goal, you have won. So the answer there is rather obvious. So parts, however, are just the beginning of this. Does it mean that uh, no rules books? Uh, it means that people cannot predict the rules. So when I have when I have this in this case, so the question mark is they were able to get some but not all. So just this is kind of like either they had no idea, had some idea that was correct, or yes, were able to tell me exactly. So partially predicted. 
Yes. So Flip City, in this case, had the number of players printed on the box, yet participants were unable to find this. Hive Pocket has nothing written on the bag. It's just pieces inside of a bag. Yet the participants were still able to identify the number of players because the tiles had two colors. There was black pieces and white pieces. Best to find in this were Pirate Flux and, and Carcion, again, because it has the rules built into the cards or colors and images on the tiles that pushed players to move in the right direction. Least to find was Condo Thierry. Condo Thierry is based off of wars between like Cesare, Borgia, and kind of the Italian city states. So there's things like the Pope card that prevents a battle from happening in a certain area. And it just has a picture of the Pope. There's cards where it's basically like uh, various knights and battlers and et cetera in there. And there's also ones that look like scarecrows. And the idea is if you put down a, a, a knight and then later on you can play a scarecrow and it allows you to pick up the knight because it was a fake knight that was on the board. So without a good understanding of you know, that era of medieval conflict and what all these things mean and the symbology on it, it was very hard for the players to come up with what all of this meant. It's just, there's a card here and it has a knight on it and it has a number, I guess this is like a trick taking game. Okay, you're getting close, but nowhere near. So the theming had a really, really heavy problem with it. Okay, so we were dealing with, in this case, primarily Russian students and showing them Italian theming. So maybe there was some sort of theming that I could make it where instead of the Pope, it's the patriarch. Maybe that would better signal something. Maybe instead of you know these various uh, pieces, I have something that's closer to you know the Russian culture that allows for a better symbology to understand this. We see the same thing actually with the first version of Love Letter was uh, done inside of more of a Japanese theme, and the international edition has more of a Western theme of like trying to get a letter to the princess. So we also looked at then. Uh, does age and education affect these outcomes? So that was our quick pilot study, just kind of a, a check on what uh, Davenau had done before. And what we did instead was we started to look at um, basically professors versus students inside of the building here. So we had 16 of this kind of, you know, highly technical, have a PhD class, and we had 37 participants of, you know, that early student class. So does education help us? Okay. And so the question became, does age in this case mean wisdom in regards to it? Okay. So there's a lot of arguments that age reduces the speed of learning, the speed of action. There's also arguments that, that age provides more logical capacity, executive function until senility. There's also arguments that education affords critical thinking. So but students are maybe more exposed to the domain, more likely to play board games. So they potentially have a better conceptual model creation from this perspective. We looked at a couple of games. Hive Pocket. So this from a limited study has been shown to have uh, interesting factors such as the number of players, linkage with the roles of these creatures. Each creature basically has different types and the goal here is to kind of surround the queen. So it's a little bit like chess or checkers or something like that, but there's no elimination. There's just placing your piece on top of another piece and then trying to surround. They have different moves. So kind of analogous to chess with checkmates. And so in this case, we can look at one of the professors in the study. I think that a player wins when he can place the yellow queen bee piece surrounded by its soldiers. There should be a rule about which piece they could connect to, a spider connect to any other insects since it's going to use its web. I chose the bee to be the queen since there's three insects, but only one piece among them. The mosquito looks like an evil soldier. The ladybug is not elegant enough to be queen. Ladybugs can attack ants, I guess. So what we see in this is the professors are exercising a very large conceptual model. They're taking in all of this information that they have from all of these different places to try to grab the point of the game. And so they're utilizing the framework of the game. What is this game showing you in terms of these images? And not just trying to say, it looks like this type of mechanics but also using these kind of other linkages. So we did some quantitative analysis. So they were collected into various categories. 
So various pieces have strengths, stones have different powers. This can hop over ants. We then looked at some distributions on this. So professors were more likely to say that uh, stones are placed one, one at a time, more likely than students. They were less likely to declare that the white stones play first. I mean, this is an old chess analog trope. And more likely to care that each piece has a strength. So there was differences between these two groups. We also looked at it in terms of Hanabi. Hanabi has these kind of strange alternative rules where you are the only person not allowed to look at your hand of cards. And so part of this is trying to pass communication back and forth to one another. So this is a cooperative game. The majority of uh, participants were greatly confused by this rule that you were not supposed to look at your own cards because it violates so many other games that are out there it violates this idea of looking at your cards. It's a complete turnaround. So they were unable able to declare this from the game objects. A lot of people thought that this was some sort of version of poker or Uno, and a lot also saw this as a game of competition and not cooperation. Once we stated the rules, wow, that's really neat, because it subverted their expectations. And so one, one professor actually went so far as to request at the time that I bring him five copies as Christmas gifts for his friends. So I had to ship those over. So general findings from this, the professor's outcomes were more in doubt and usually more correct. Students would very quickly want to give up on the problem, more likely to get a I don't know, and less likely to engage in, re in reflective thought. However, nobody was good at Hanabi. Nobody was good because it completely opposes our normal conceptual model of what is a game and how you're supposed to play with cards. So it's hard to apply that then. Your current learning is fighting against what it's supposed to do. So in this case, purposeful violations of preconceived uh, conceptual notions might exist in objects and be worth the enjoyment. So if you can violate inside of your board game some normal action that you make within it, this might be something that people see as playful and enjoyable. Okay. So I'm gonna take our break here. And when we okay. come back, we can take a look at dice. Okay, thank you. So we will now have a 10 minutes, okay, 15 minutes break. Uh, and then uh, we'll get back at 12. 55. Thank you, Jim. Okay, so uh, we are continuing now. Great. So welcome back, everybody. I hope I got a chance to get a nice cool drink on this very, very hot day inside of Kazan. For those of you joining us internationally or, or not outside of here, it's like what, 36 today, 37? I hope not. Somewhere hope like that. Right? But, but the, the, yeah, the forecast is this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to look again uh, at another object inside of this, another bit of a focus on dice, one of the oldest and most popular objects within games. There are burial goods of this dating back to you know the Egyptians, back to the Roman antiquity. You know, they're, they're found all over the place, uh, they move through various carved different uh, bones, uh, different symbols, sizes, shapes, contrasts, and colors. And so how these have kind of moved around and been changed is kind of one of the interesting things. Okay. And so we see this, especially uh, inside of Dungeons and Dragons, right? That there's uh, basically, we can see this as being this, this proliferation of dice that have been created by this game. Um, and there's lots of very fun dice that are on the market, such as these, which are a rogue set. So they're for a rogue inside of the game. It's thing, all objects that yield the rogue. Or a wizard set. So you can kind of match them with your character and the colors are different. Or maybe you want to have paladin you know, shaped ones. There's some different colors. Or maybe you want them to be metal. That could be a, something you want. Or you can get you know, these types of Kickstarters with all these different colors. Lots of different sizes, shapes, colors, all sorts of different things. Okay. And this is a place where a lot of kind of mom and pop industries have moved into. This is not really big giant industry that's making these types of objects. In fact, this one here, Little Dragon Corp, that's like 
two people that I know from, from Canada that are doing that and they're creating Kickstarters and fundings to do that. So all of these leads to it. So there's a lot of demand in this kind of creator driven market for research. These are smaller operators, sole proprietorships, family businesses, and they all have these kind of big Kickstarter dreams. And even the big giant corporations, a lot of them started here. So Games Workshop actually used to make uh, objects for D and D. Off of that. Uh, that was how they got their production lines in place. And then after that, they created their own game, and now they're you know everywhere. Hobby Games has like walls of them. So we wanted to investigate some ideas of fairness. How do people perceive dice when it's different than the one that they're using? So there's lots of different shapes that we can make dice out of that have this kind of perfect Euclidean shape, but there's also lots of different formats that are not. So we can have normal dice in this case, we could have skewed dice. So these are all kind of slightly tilted, same dice size. And here we have more of an unusual piece of dice here. So these ones, what happens is this has one, two, three, and this has the numbers from one to six in different proportions. You can see it has two sixes. Well, this is actually mathematically set up that when you roll it, it has the exact same distribution as 2d6, but they're cast differently. So this is known as a recast 2d6. Now you can use them individually as a single d6 or take the value off of it and then the value off of it. But in this case, if you want just to take out a 2d6 distribution, this provides the exact same distribution. So mathematically, as 2d6, these are equivalent. The normal dice, the skewed dice, and the unusual dice. And to within engineering tolerant tolerances, these are fair. So they're not weighted beyond what we would naturally see with the creation of these types of dice. Okay? Even normal dice are not really perfectly fair because you're drilling out larger amounts of material on one side than another. And this is why you see, for example, in casinos that they do not use uh, dice with drill holes. They use it with painted. And even there, there's issues with how's the weight of the ink effect. So our initial study, we looked at this uh, and we had basically uh, a question of, do you think that these dice are fair? We had them play with them for a while. On, a, on basically a modified snakes and ladders sort of game, mostly just to get them the sense of rolling the dice. After that, we then asked again, do you find these dice to be fair? So prior to using them, after using them, did the usage change your perceptions of the dice? So in terms of that, what we found is that they found that, that after playing with them, there was an increase in the fairness. However, what happened was the unusual ones continued to have issues over time. Yeah, what was the biggest place? Hmm? There was a slide of all the participants. Yes. Yeah, 65%, 48 males, 17 females, age between 18 and 30. So what the, what the students are just 18? Students and basically anybody that we could bring into the room. So our oldest was 57. So we just kind of grabbed people in order to have a sense of this. We broke it down over gender and a couple other lines, but there was no major findings. So because of this, the, uh, they basically all said the normal dice was fair because they were already familiar with it. The decision about unusual dice was mostly unfair because of repeated numbers on the dice. But for both of these, the majority of participants said that they were unfair because the shape wasn't symmetric. And so after the playing, there was an increase in the perceptions of fairness, but there was still this holding on to not quite. So what does this say then about our uh, creation of dice that look like daggers and things like that? This might lead to a bit of an upsetness at the table at your gaming club, because they may think that they're also weighted somehow or skewed or changed somehow. One interesting observation is when they when they looked at this, they were curious, however, to try out these types of dice. So there is a bit of a novelty factor to them. 
So I would say that for new players of D&D, &D, the normal 7P seven, seven set in, in chess X uh, setup would probably be more appropriate for them, is would be my thinking. And then on from there, maybe we can get into something more unusual. Uh, and in fact, we looked into this. So these are the canonical seven dice set. Originally, these were based off of dice for using uh, for teachers. So these dice did exist before D and D, except they were used as examples for probability for high school students. And then they were co-opted into this game, and then started to be created from that. So we looked at experienced players with Dungeons and Dragons or some other role-playing game, and unexperienced players. So about equal groups. From this, we then retested those sets of dice. So we aim to keep the number and coloring as consistent as possible. We want to purely look at the difference in the mold between this polyhero wizard set, which we got in parchment and black ink, and a Chessex model, that number, uh, an ivory marble. So these are basically the exact same dice for the purposes within the game. And we tried as closely as possible to replicate the color of the dice. So the only thing that we hopefully are testing is then the shape. How does the shape affect it? Okay. But at a closer view of that, you can see not perfect match, but we're never going to get there unless we have the dice producers work with the exact same material. That is close as possible that we could make. So based on the previous findings, we were looking at there's this issue of recasting the dice. And looking at what Polyhero had to say about the fairness of their dice, because again, is the weighting okay? What did they do? Uh, Polyhero's made statements about that they aim for that fairness in their engineering techniques when they build these. And they're to the point where they even take into account the weight of the ink that they use. So if one number has more ink than the other, they're worried about it. And they're trying to put in engineering controls to make sure that these are as fair as they can. And Jan May from there said, we do design them to be used, not something to be looked at. There's a lot of other dice that may not have that property. So we're going to assume for all sakes and purposes that to, as close to engineering spec as we can, that these are fair. So for the study, we're going to assume that we're looking at just the shape. And we had them play a modified like D&D &D encounter, the, uh, idea of this was recasting this into uh, a TA and a student fighting over a grade. So in order to draw people in and inside of the book and inside of the paper, there's the rule set for this modified D&D. And what we found was that experienced players preferred to use the recast dice. They enjoyed it in terms of what they found. Nobody said that the normal Chessex dice were unfair. I mean, they look like normal dice. So we're only gonna look at the fairness that they perceive within the wizard set. And in terms of this, what happened was, is that playing them were increased the amount of people that said, yes, these are fair. So experience with them led to uh, them stating that it was fair. Okay. Inexperienced changed their minds at a significant rate. They were more likely to start thinking that these dice were unfair and were more likely at the end to also change their minds. Whereas experienced players were more likely to believe that they were unfair to be, or less likely to believe that they were unfair to begin with. However, they didn't change their minds as a result of playing with it as much as the inexperienced. So the question then becomes, what does this say about who would purchase maybe this product? seems like I'm targeting more of the experienced crowd and maybe I put it towards that. So uh, <clears throat> I have a question. So uh, to, in my opinion, these uh, tables uh, are not very uh, intuitive. I mean, I, I cannot clearly see what, what is before and yeah. what, what is for after. So if they stated before that it was unfair, did they state after that it was unfair? So they, if they stated before it was fair, they also stated before it was fair. You'll see that nobody went from fair to unfair. So before is on this side. What did you state before and what did you state after? 
So this position here would be, I thought it was unfair. I still think it's unfair. Uh -huh. I thought uh, it was yes, unfair. So I think it's fair. So, so five people changed their mind. So it reflects the change. Yes. Okay. okay. And then here, I thought it was fair and it's now unfair. Nobody did that. In fact, nobody did that over here. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fair and now it's changed to fair. So if you're on the main diagonal, you didn't change your mind. If you're off the main diagonal, then you changed your mind. So I, I, it's just um, yeah. my, my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you may probably, you might probably remove the words before and after because I think you don't need them. Okay. They, they, they just... Uh, I would consider that to probably be fair. <laughs> Thank you. After your after your statement. So it means that people trust the experience here. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it means that the inexperienced were more likely to flop over than the unexperienced. But what we can see is after playing with the dice, there is some amount. So here there was five people that changed their minds, and here there was three people that changed so their minds. So people believe in their experience even yes. more than in one. Yes. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, again, they're seeing this object for the first time. What's their perception of the object? If you, all you've ever seen is dice that are perfectly symmetrical, that are perfectly, you know, weighted and that, and then I go and show you this thing, you can go, hmm, does that really have fairness? In fact, the question of fairness comes into your mind immediately when you see these dice, because it's like, this isn't a die. A die is a perfectly beautiful platonic solid, whereas here, this is not. You just... You just uh, throw it an, inf an infinite number of times and you see yeah it. exactly that's part <laughs> of the problem is that you in order to prove this would be me sitting here for the rest of my life rolling this die and rolling another die and making sure that they come out to the same distribution until the end of time because you can't really prove that they are we can't even really prove that anything is truly random but that's a, another philosophy problem for another day so what we found was that recast dice were more suited for the experienced player. They're more likely to be found fair without difficulty. And perhaps uh, companies should look into maybe ways that they can use this inside of their marketing to market that these are indeed fair. And we looked also at some old six-sided dice in terms of this. So here, some old, if simple archaeology museum ones. Here's some that are actually at the Hermitage from the uh, Sharpo Fortress, in the Rostov Overblast. These are old Roman dice that are around. Is there any, is there any uh, idea what uh, they were used for? So it could just be gambling. There's of course the belief that this was used for like gaming and gambling. Like, you know, just today as we have like craps and things like that. Um, astragals, there's, there's um, written, uh, there's written divination pieces for this, that bones were carved for different divination ceremonies. And thermomancy is using dice, so rolling dice for this. Um, there's also lots of kind of historical evidence throughout the years of like priests being told, you shouldn't be playing dice games or limiting dice games to certain days of the year. There's comments about Christmas is becoming horrible because now people use it to play dice and gamble and things instead of like the Puritans and that. So there's lots of evidence that these objects were used for those types of pieces. And they're very commonly found as grave goods or on Roman soldiers as they move around. So pretty much the same sort of stuff that we use them today for gaming, gambling, pastimes is what was happening with them then. So we get kind of then into color psychology, right? How does color then affect the dice? And it's that visualization work with, right? Red makes you hungry, maybe. There's some ideas of this. Color blindness becomes a bit of an issue. So we have to test everybody for color blindness before doing this study. We used a color blindness test for that. And we had them basically order the colors by preference, followed by the dice by preference. So which dice do you prefer versus which colors do you prefer? So we had a corresponding color to a corresponding die. Now the question here was, well, if I prefer blue and I state I like blue, do I prefer blue dice? We would assume that that would be the outcome, right? I prefer blue. Not really, yeah, that's the problem. That was my expected outcome. So the question with this was, are we going to get this? And again, this gets back into the question of how do we market to players? terms of the objects. 
but something odd is happening. There's no real trend. So what we found was that color preference really does not correlate to dice preference of color of the dice. And then we dug deeper. We said, said okay, what about disruption? Maybe it's maybe you're just stating the three colors, but they're stated in a, in a different order for some reason. And nope, not really. We tried, the study failed. And I think that that even is kind of a fun finding that it seems like your actual preference of color does not affect your dice color preference. So usability. Well, so we've seen that color preference is a poor measure of what colors prefer they prefer to use. In this case, what we did was we had them arrange and sort them from one to four by what was on the dice. So the idea here is, okay, maybe it isn't color, maybe it's the difference, the, the ability to see the numbers. And for that, we looked into readability in terms of this, and we had some kind of unusual different color contrasts on dice to try to see if we could find ones that were more likely to be misread. Maybe people are not using them because I can't read them very well. And pretty much we found that certain colors did come up with errors or confusion in their numbering by playing this game. We did observations, photographed it, camera it, did everything we could in order to observe the process of them rolling. And the idea here is they were supposed to state what number was on the die to the uh, opponent correctly. And so anytime that they made a mistake, they said a different number, we considered that an error. Anytime that they said a number and they were like, oh, no, wait, it's this, we considered that a confusion. So it was correct. And we can see that the most errors and confusions happen on this clear die here. So maybe that could also explain why we were having issues with what's your favorite dice here, because these were all clear coded. So that might also affect the color. So reading difficulty, white unclear was the loser in terms of reading the die. Clearly the loser. Two errors and 26 confusions over this. However, players stated it was exotic, interesting, and they were excited to use this kind of like invisible die. Black on white, that works well. Thank goodness. Congratulations, everyone. The one that we by default throw into every game actually seems to work. But we could also select black on gray, white on transparent black, and bright bright green on dark red, but however, we need to be aware of, of course, color blindness. Okay, so we looked at this and a lot of the selections were based on it, uh, ex exoticness and also controllability and readability. So it seems like the aesthetic choice of dice is not one factor. It's not, we can say, okay, well, I like the color blue, I will have like blue dice, which sadly for our friends making dice, a bit of an issue. So I promised also that there would be a bit of a, how does this then step into the idea of software engineering? And one thing that I really like is rules, 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 rules. I'm interested in how they're developed. Um, often systems love to create rules, but not destroy rules, right? It's easy to pass a law. It's hard to repeal a law. So we created an activity to kind of examine rule creations. The idea here was we're just going to have people add on rules into a system and wait until it breaks the system. So everybody goes, this is stupid. What are we doing? And part of this was also wanting to engage learners in the class with an activity. So it was also from a pedagogical perspective done in more of an active learning way. So they were creating a game. What is the game? Well, so I provided a space and a number of balls, some kind of tennis balls and a few other things like that. Class was split in this case to two teams with a facilitator each. The game was generated by the following process. First, a player stated a rule. So pass the ball to someone, could be a rule. You must pass the ball, okay. Then the play progresses for two to three minutes, just enough to get them a sense of the game, what is happening inside of it. Then the next person gets to decide a rule. So maybe the next rule is if you drop the ball, you're out, whatever out means. Then the play progressed. Then they go back again. Okay, uh, you have to throw the ball with your right hand. Okay, that's the new rule, goes around. 
Okay, you have to catch the ball with your left hand. And we can see that this keeps on adding on and adding on and adding on. That continued until the rules for the side that it grew to be too hard to follow to declare the round over. And that progressed for a few different rounds. And the stated goal to the players was create a game with the most rules possible. So what we then did is a reflection afterwards and looked at this via what was known as the uh, focused conversation model. So this was originally developed uh, by a art professor and uh, army chaplain um, as a method of reflection and uh, appreciation of art. And so the idea of this was there is no expert. Everybody has been here. Everybody's looked at the painting. How can we kind of discuss it and understand it? In this case, everybody was in this rule building process. How can we discuss it and understand it? So the idea is to come to a meaning by a series of different viewpoints. And the truth is based on kind of conjoining all of these different subjective opinions, that there is no universal truth that someone does, does there. So this is not me as just the observer going, this is what happened in the game. I want to actually have the students also elicit what happened. This is also known as the ORID method or ORID method because there's some stages of questioning that follow that. So what we wanted to do was look at the rules of games inside of this. And there's a lot of issues of trying to come up with rules inside of games and what is allowed and what is not allowed. And if you look at current meta inside of any big online game, you'll see this all the time. That's not fair. You shouldn't be able to, they should patch, they should nerf, they should buff these various objects. And we can see rules as the players are going to abide by setting out expectations to play and actions that are out of bounds. So we started out with an objective level of questioning. So this is what happened. Objectively, what happened? So we're trying to get a clear agreement of this. I passed the ball to you. What were the rules? So questions inside of this level were what instructions were given by the facilitator? What objects do you use? What rules did you make? What rules did you produce? What rule caused the game to end? So very much low level, what happened? From there, we then start to look at reflection in terms of it. So questions that are on the base level thoughts. What are your emotions on this? So how did you feel when you were engaging in the activity? Why did you choose these objects? Did the number of rules increase over time? What did you notice? What were your feelings about the rules that you produced? How did you feel the game was at an end? When did you know this? From there, we then begin to interpret it, put these things together. So we're looking at the meaning of these connections. And we're looking for this to emerge based off of everybody kind of having a sense of what happened again. Because maybe I didn't see certain things that happened. Maybe I didn't understand that you were upset by me adding this rule. Now we can start to say what happened. What rules were better for the game? What rules were con contradictory and how did you solve this problem? What, 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 why did that rule lead to an end of the game? Not just what rule. And at this point, then we can get into the decision. So based upon all these interpretations, what actions should now be undertaken? What did you learn? So this also leads naturally into then a documentation as to what to do next. So what rules would you want to keep in future games? What rules would you want to avoid in future games? What did you learn about rule systems? So this sort of structured development of this questioning is done in this process in order to prevent people from kind of leaping to the end where they say, we're going to do this without having the foundation and the communication with everybody else inside of the group. So as a facilitator, that was part of my job inside of this when we were doing the discussion rounds. So some outcomes from this, what kind of happened? Well, later rounds of this game went longer. So people got better at building larger rule sets without contradictions and complaints that caused it to fail. There was a development of anti-rules. So in this, we never said that you may, uh, we never explicitly said you may repeal a rule, but people could put in rules that kind of counteracted other rules inside of it. And I think that that's something that we see a lot of the times inside of law, right? Oh, we put in this law. Now we have 12 billion loopholes on top of this law. Now we have loopholes for the loopholes, loopholes for the loopholes, right? There's, there's no back to start to rebuild it. 
So some rules were then patched by later rules gluing onto them. And in some cases, the facilitator was that myself was drawn in as an appeal. Like, oh, Billy can't do that because you know that's not fair. He can't make that rule. Okay, yeah, he can. That's his chance to make a rule. Can you change it going forward? It was enough usually to kind of stop these problem cases. There was, for example, one rule where it had to do with like catching the ball. Um, if you if you if you don't draw or if you drop the ball, you're out and you have to catch it in such a very weird way. And one of the students decided the best way to stop from being out for throwing the ball and somebody else not catching it is don't throw the ball. And of course, everybody was like, you have to throw the ball. And my response was, is there a rule that says he has to throw the ball? Oh, okay, he's found a loophole. So there was these kind of naturally occurring creations, loopholes and this, and then anti-rules and those kind of requests for appeal to kind of correct the situations inside there. So very interesting to see. This then kind of moves into the idea of coming up with requirements in terms of engineering. So it's supposed to be somewhat of a software engineering talk. I'm, I'm sorry it took this long to get into anything close to software engineering in a way. But the idea of this is looking at uh, the process of requirements and the conversations required. So working with the stakeholder requires such conversations. And again, this type of process of understanding can be applied to that sort of software engineering. And we have a paper coming out soon. So Emna and Alexander and uh, Michelle and myself are going to be saying this out soon. I think we'll let what the next version of it just went in to revise and review. So hopefully that will be out soon and I can maybe come back and talk more about that or Alexander, you can talk about this a bit more in the future. So with that, I'll say thank you to everyone for attending on such a very warm day and coming out all this way for it. Um, that's my contact information. If there's any other questions, and I guess I'll open up the floor if there's anyone on the Zoom that has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Well, that, that, does anybody have a question? I actually have a question. Mm -hmm. question is like, but I guess that idea of choosing the, the preference of color and uh, then trying to figure out uh, which color is the best for the something mm -hmm. uh, is wrong idea itself. <laughs> I originally I would disagree with you now that I've seen this, maybe I am more inclined. And I think that's the interesting piece of this is uh, it is something where it seems intuitive that it would or would not be to a lot of people, but nobody's really done the test to see if that's the case. And in this case, if uh, you know, dice are kind of it's not like an object that you would originally think has like a purpose where it has to be a certain color. You would think that people then would, and, and I've heard like watching people, it's like, oh, why do you have those dice? Because they're green. There are people that say things like that. So that's why I wanted to see if it was actually understandable in the data of a larger set, and it doesn't seem to be so. So the, there's probably multiple confounding factors here. Uh, and that's kind of the interesting bit of that study from that perspective is it failed statistically to find what I was expecting. But now I don't know what is the answer. I would also yeah. change the question. Uh, so uh, may I throw something yeah. on the desk? Sure. So um, do we have a mic? Yes, plenty of them. Yeah. So the idea was like uh, we have different colors, like know, green, uh, red, mm -hmm. uh, yellow. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you have to choose the most so, so which you like more. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, you have to choose which color of dices do you prefer the most. Yes. But um, 
So I think that like color, so the best color is related to the thing itself. So when you uh, ask about not dices, for example, but I don't know about t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, if, if we were if you would be the same uh, problem, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is because I mean it then turns into like there's other impact factors there. Yeah. I, I maybe maybe I wear a certain color t-shirt because it's business appropriate versus not business appropriate. Mm -hmm. I could really like you know the color mauve, but maybe my organization I'm going into only allows you to wear black and white or whatever. So there's other factors on top of this. See, my thinking with this was dice are kind of a personal private thing, you know, that you're not really like you're you're kind of thinking more for your personality. So my assumption would be that you would get more of a match. But what if you choose a question to the in another in, in another way? For example, at the beginning you have different color of uh, dices. Yeah. Uh, you ask people which uh, dices do you like the most. And then ask them what and happens. Then, and then say, you, what colors do you prefer afterwards? Yes, somehow. But you you uh, let them play, for example, game, and you uh, put for them a different set of uh, these dice. Yeah. And if they prefer the color that they uh, prefer at the beginning, I have, I have the dice in my office. So if you'd like to do this setting and get together <laughs> 60 people in order to, to, to do it, I'd be more than happy to support you in that endeavor. But I don't, I can't. At this point, I can't really spend it. Would be my answer. So, the idea is, is what uh, this uh, relation of yeah. choosing is not uh, the best relation. This one will be closer to their real preferences. Yeah, but the issue here is this question of, hey, you play with these dice now, pick a favorite color, doesn't really help the people that are producing dice. Because the idea here is, can I ask my users questions mm -hmm. and then say, this is the dice you should buy? Mm -hmm. So if I was to say, here's some dice that you have, now tell me what color. If I was selling colors, you'd have a great, great you know, link between them. But I think this has to do with then the direction that they're interested in and understanding. Because the idea of this study and the colors was I had people who built dice asking what colors do people prefer and could we like ask them what colors you prefer and then say now you should buy this color of dice. And it doesn't seem like that is the case. Maybe, maybe. Thank you. Yeah. It still was possible to <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, I can. I think we can consider. Uh, we can we can close the. Thank you. I think we can close this uh, session. So uh, thanks everyone for attending. And thank you for your kind invitation to to talk. You're welcome uh, to, to join. Great. Sure. Okay. Bye. Thank, thank you. Julie. Bye. Goodbye.